Twitter and Facebook and all those accounts where we publicise the activities and the good news stories of our businesses. But we also have a, uh, two pages a month in the World of Road specifically uh, for the page where we publicise events, publicise businesses and opportunities that exist in the this area. Uh, I've mentioned the events um, particularly uh, aimed at getting people back in, changing the whole perception. environment. Um, the litter picks have been wonderful, cost nobody nothing. Uh, the businesses have got together, the police have got together and just gone around and picked up literally sack loads and sack loads of rubbish from the, uh, the sidewalks. Um, and we are working with the council and others to look at how we can improve that environment further. We will certainly be lighting up the video. get into trouble, partly because it is, as this one is, a, a mixture of different businesses and therefore, and that's, it's hard to please all the different groups, but one area where they seem to get into trouble is when they, is accounting for why they spent the money. So will, when we get to the end of 12 months, will the, the accounts be in the public domain for the bid? And will, for instance, this committee have an opportunity to scrutinise how that money was spent?
sp uh, the internet. I don't, I don't envisage us and monitor it spending off full £400,000 this year. In fact, I hope we don't. We shouldn't. Uh, because we will want to invest some money that we'll need to save up to invest in something bigger in year three or year four. If you look at Liverpool as an example, uh, in the old Hall Street, the commercial bit, they've just paid for all the block paving to be introduced. Now, they've saved up for the last three and a half years out of their money to do that. We will do something like that, but I think we need to work with the council and the businesses to understand more what it is that they're prioritising people. I do agree uh, that sand is an issue. So you can get information to businesses at one press of a button. And I'm thinking about we need to be ready for the impact. We all know, or does everybody know, there's going to be significant disruption around Hamlet Square Station in January. A period of four weeks at the front, three weeks at the end, we'll, we'll, we'll be out of action. So I'm hoping that this, this will be a perfect consultation body to work with Mersey Travel, Mersey Rail, and lessen the impact of that station closing. So, so I think it's a fantastic consultation group. Uh, about getting information out because we know we know we have difficulty getting information to businesses direct. So so we'll more strength here, Kevin. Well done. Thank you. Okay, just one final It's still Birkenhead. 
And although your ideas are very, very grand, I only hope that you're going to roll this out further so you take a larger footprint of that slice of what we call, which is really, truly Birkenhead. Well, I think, Chair, if I can answer that, uh, it is quite simply a question of economics. Um, the need, the bid is funded through the businesses in that area paying a 1.5% rent. Um, so this is the main, main concentration of the businesses. If we start going out into other areas, there are the number of businesses there to pay the levy to make the bid in that area, something that anyone can do. So it is down to the number of businesses that can then uh, pay the levy for us to be able to deliver what we're trying to deliver in the basic area. So it's purely economic? Yeah, absolutely. Purely so economic. So economic. So the daily estate, which is actually full of businesses, mm. it's a no-go area. So, hey, hey George, that doesn't seem right, does it? Only people would speak up as well as this gentleman did. I have an audibility problem at the back here, in that most of the speakers so far have been on the front row here, and they have addressed you directly. They have not stood to make their points, and if they go on uh, making several points or developing a point, I would like very much to hear it. So would such speakers stand up? and address the far end of the meeting and not a conversational tone with yourself. Thank you.
mentioned a supported by a volunteer and pilot with a particular focus on, on Birkenhead, and that was about testing out an approach with local people around different types of volunteering, and it's what's called um, a first steps program. So this wasn't about getting into employment, this was getting people ready, even thinking about um, being ready to apply for a job and actually being fit and able to, to take those, uh, those, those jobs on. And there was success within that program, without, without a doubt, there was a job outcome rate of 10% and 62% um, of those who took part did take part in some sort of volunteering. It wasn't necessarily the formal volunteering through the Volunteer Bureau, it's much more within their communities and being part of their communities and supporting, supporting regular people. We also did some um, work with local businesses through uh, working with the Chamber of and we had a workshop um, hosted by the Chamber. And that really brought home to us some real uh, insight into what the businesses were saying about working with this client group. And really, it was highlighted that for businesses, and I think for most of us maybe, if somebody's got a physical problem, then actually it's easier to deal with that than people with mental health issues. And I didn't highlight it on the earlier slide, it showed that 50% of people So because of a mental health issue. We also heard from local businesses that actually those people already in work they were dealing with significant issues around mental, mental well-being. And when I'm talking about that, I'm not necessarily talking about people with a diagnosis of a mental health issue, but people perhaps with anxiety uh, and, and depression. <coughs> so there was, there was a need for us to do something and to think about um, what we do to support people who were a long way from to add to this uh, work that we, because we, we've got lots of data, I'm amazed at the investment team and the way that they, the data that they've got, the way that they understand the market. Um, but what we wanted to do was to hear from local people, and I think I can say on behalf of all three of us, that for us, working with a company called Ezro, we really got, I think, underneath some of the issues that we um, struggled with for, for quite some time. So we commissioned this piece of work, Call it insight work, market research, talking to local people. Um, we really wanted them to go out and talk to the people who don't talk to people like me, or to Helen, or to Bear, and to really understand what were the demands um, that they have on their time, and what were the challenges they were facing about feeling that they were, they were fit for work. So what did they do? Some of you might say, well, actually, Julie, they didn't talk to many people.
So people felt that there was actually quite a lot of, well, the research found quite a lot of dependency and quite a lot of affirming negative views actually just within, within the communities. And that then led to demotivation of people to actually get involved, not just about getting involved in getting ready for work, but actually just taking part in the activities <coughs> and going out and about. Some of the case studies that we found are really quite shocking. Certainly for me, somebody who's worked in the public sector now for over 25 years, it was um, some people really in quite a quite very difficult um, places. The other thing we heard, and I'm sure again what this surprised people, was really about perverse incentives, and where people saw that actually being on um, employment support allowance was the best place to be, and actually moving to the different benefits of job seekers allowance was actually seen as a failure. to us a confusing service provision landscape, as I said to you before. There's lots of provision locally, lots of good provision locally, but people find it difficult to access. And there's lots of people not in, 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 in contact. There's often as well unrealistic goals for people, and it's a real challenge for me as somebody who commissions services is that actually we often found um, we were commissioning services here, but people were actually actually uh, commission, we call them uh, a network of community connectors, so these are, sort of, these are people that will be based and recruited from the local areas that will be able to work with local people, knock on doors, talk to them, engage with them, understand where they are at the moment and then support them to get to be where they need to be. And I think you don't want them to be um, a constant within that person's life, it's very much about moving them on. Get 
allows the Commission to reach out again through European funds, which the Commission is about £5 million pounds of European programmes uh, for the local authority, uh, the three different programmes to get people back into work. I think the thing we've identified here is, even though how successful the Reach Out programme has been, we've seen people that are just so far away, they do need something that fits between that gap between health and employment, and Reach Out are not a health provider as they are employment, although they did that small scale pilot again gave a few people in. These will be commissioned services, who knows will go on uh, to deliver that, who has the right skills and expertise, but I think to us it's really key that that first steps, people, as Julia said before, that they're, that they're not sick enough to be accessing health services, which sometimes are uh, a crisis or episode point, but they're not close enough to the labour market either. But we see that the feed not only into involved with West, but we've been working with Job Centre Plus because there's a role here to feed back and be to maximise our mainstream employment programmes as well by putting something at the beginning of the field, it's not happening elsewhere. <coughs> We've done a lot of work with 
the Community Pay Back team, which is what used to be called probation, right across the head, it's been very successful. We've actually scheduled them in, we've got a process where they do urgent jobs for us, jobs within three days and jobs within a week, and it's really um, helping with things like weed, which are a massive problem at the moment, and it's also helping with um, alleyway cleansing, getting rid of vegetation so Biffa can, can come in and get bins. So again, just wanted to highlight the really good work of the Community Payback team and we're going to continue it, it in the future and we'll try and get um, an estimate of what, how many man hours that will be and what sort of amount of money it's worth to us um, because we use them on a daily basis in lots of different areas so it, it really just has worked very well. Um, we've been allocated 60k uh, for the committee works this year and after speaking to the environmental task group chair and the chair, um, we would like to recommend that 20k be allocated for environmental works over the next year. Um, so if, if that's something the, the committee would like to agree to, uh, it's actually been proposed and it's, it's under recommendations in your report. That's 20k to be delegated to the environmental task group to be allocated to environmental works for this year. Um, I'm Anna from the St James Centre and you'll, you'll have read in your report pack um, about some of the activities that we've been doing um, since February with a growing number of people. Um, not just holiday um, provision but all year round as Joan has said and in addition to the, um, to the statistics that you'll see in front of you we do run a weekly programme of activities after school club with children and young people where we see on average 30 a week who will receive something to eat. Uh, and any parents accompanying them are also welcome to eat. We don't distinguish between the children and the parents. We also run monthly meal shares where we encourage the community to come <coughs> together and bring a dish, whatever that might be, and we'll provide something together. And it's about the community getting together, sitting around a table, conversing with each other and enjoying a meal. We provide community markets, which are once a quarter, and a, um, themed events such as the big lunch, which... Uh, we saw nearly 300 people this year to our big lunch and Queen's birthday party event. Um, just a quick update on where we're up to with the summer holidays. Um, we've started uh, just this week and already this week we've provided 110 meals and that's of, that's of today so the week isn't over yet. And that's split between breakfasts and lunches. And we're, we're working much more closely with a um, variety of partners as well, local authority, the children's centres, um, to encourage families and to make sure <coughs> families are appropriately signposted as well as food bank and working closely with food bank as you'll have seen with our work with um, both Involved North West with the welfare element of the project and um, Birkenhead Head Relief from Sickness where we've been able to provide white goods to families that we identify there and then in the evening that are actually struggling with budgeting because they don't have a cooker or cooking facilities in the property as well as fuel to enable them to produce a meal at home. Going forward, our initiative <laughs> is very much about trying to understand um, the whole family situation and to address um, food challenges throughout the year. So we'll be working closely with Lifelong Learning to provide um, a programme of activities, 10-week training, uh, which will include the qualification in food hygiene, nutrition or allergy awareness. And as part of that, looking at budgeting and producing meals on a budget in the hope that when families come to holiday periods, money isn't so tight when it comes to food. Um, and there are plans in place to work with Can Cook as well to expand the work that we're doing around our junior chef school and family cooking. 
I think, as, as George has already mentioned tonight, partnership is key, and we work, work very closely with the other food hubs to make sure that we're maximising opportunity. Um, George can't be here tonight, but we do work particularly closely with George at Beechwood uh, and with Luke at Gorky Road, who's been instrumental in organising with his church pallets that we deliver at our events. Again, working closely with what they're doing at Gorky Road, where they have a, a regular opening of shop. We're, we're trying to complement what we're doing, and ours comes in and, and is delivered at events. And Emma and the team intercepting food, which we're also able to benefit from. Well, and that's that I'll pass over to Emma. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> yep, so we're the, the Rock Ferry Hub. Um, obviously, it's a year on since I last uh, sat here and, and made a presentation about our food hub. Um, we have changed venue since last year, um, but apart from that, just grown and grown with um, the amount of support that we're being able to offer and the amount of community leadership in our, in our project and community running it for themselves. Um, we have moved to Beaconsfield Community House uh, in Rock Ferry. Um, and over, over the last uh, few months, well, we've been there since February, um, 167 meals have been given to children from February up till summer. Um, on top of that, countless amounts of uh, food bags, social supermarkets. We actually have a queue around the centre now on a, on a Wednesday for our social supermarket, which we've now identified we need two social supermarkets a week, so there'll be one on a Wednesday and one on a Friday for young people. Um, because we've noticed um, the, the, the need is different, obviously, for families and, and young people. And also, we offer it fully as a page of feel option, and it is page of feel whatever people can afford. But a young person that can have a budget as little as £8.20 a week to live on, including their electricity and gas and supported living, what they feel they can pay is a lot less most of the time than families, and they're feeling a bit isolated, so they're going to have their own social supermarket now for, for young people. Uh, living on their own. Um, obviously, feeding back and head is, is one of our major priorities um, as, as NEO. Um, this last week alone, we've um, had 20 crisis food bags, um, 45 people um, in on Wednesday for the social supermarket, helping 157 individuals. Um, 69 meals to 16 to 20, 20 year olds have been given um, this week. 361 meals um, have been prepared uh, and given to children and 41 to adults over the three-day uh, programme of events. 1,235 kilograms of food have been intercepted from um, supermarkets, other retailers and um, wholesalers um, and redistributed through, fam uh, through, through to community members cooking for the children and also supporting the other projects, um, giving out 345 uh, kilos to um, other projects like, like Anna's and George's. Um, and that's all done by the commitment of amazing community volunteers um, supporting the Beaconsfield project and we've, we've took on, we've lost six into employment which is fabulous but it uh, hinders the project. Um, but we've had brilliant community volunteers and 147 hours have been given by Beaconsfield uh, residents this week to support the project. Um, so that's where we're up to. Uh, and obviously asset transfer and building is, is top of our priority.